Now, friends, we come to the 20th chapter of Jeremiah. And again, this man, may I say, used himself a great deal as an illustration. We know a great deal about this man, and it'd be very difficult to understand his prophecies without understanding him and the background of his prophecies. Now, we saw God sent him down to the potter's house And then he was told to take a bottle that the potter had made, and he was to go down to Tophet. That's in the valley of Hinnon. And at that time, it was a place of idolatry. It was a place where there was the worship of Moloch, where their children passed through the fires. And actually, that word Tophet, and you've noticed it has occurred several times in the prophecy here. The name actually has to do with drums, and it was the beating of these drums or sort of tom-toms to deaden the cries of the children that were being offered on the offer of Moloch. And it obviously was a geographical location down there. Now, the prophet goes down to Tophet, breaks the bottle, and the message then is that Jeremiah is saying that these people now are going into captivity. Josiah, the great king, the good king, is dead. And there has come to the throne, Jehoahaz, and actually he's an evil king. He wasn't there long, though. But then Jehoiakim came to the throne, And actually now we've come down to the last king, that is Zedekiah. He is the worst and also the weakest of all of the kings that ruled in Judah. And it was during his reign that the Babylonian captivity took place. Now we have seen really a transformation take place in the life of Jeremiah when he gave out the word of God. He's adamant, he's strong, he's hard-nosed, but personally, he's very weak. He has a very tender heart. And now that his friend, Josiah, the good king, is gone, and the historical record in Chronicles tells us Jeremiah wept for him. I think he loved him, and he had been his friend. Now these evil kings come to the throne And up to this point, Jeremiah has been absolutely rejected in a very definite way. He has been given a cold shoulder, and his message has been absolutely ignored. But he has not been persecuted personally. And now we come to actual persecution and pasture the son of Emmer, who, by the way, was associated with Zedekiah, as we'll see in the next chapter, he is the one now that begins to persecute this man physically. Chapter 20, verse 1, Now Pasha, the son of Emmer, the priest, who was also chief governor of the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasha smote Jeremiah the prophet, and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Now, I would like for you to notice where persecution began. It began in organized religion. The Word of God today is being hurt and hindered more by the organizational church, the liberal church that has rejected the Word of God. And they boast today of their brotherhood. They're always wanting to get together with some very shady characters. And yet they boast of their brotherhood and love for everyone, and they're broad-minded. But I found out as a fundamentalist that they don't accept me, and they exhibit very little love for me. May I say to you that their broad-mindedness is not real, and their great concern just doesn't happen to be real. I happen to have been associated with an organization for a long time, and I know what I'm talking about here, my friend. And that's where persecution and the hindrance of the gospel today comes. Do you know who really wants to get this program and other programs off the air? Organized religion today. I don't know of a liquor industry that's trying to get us off. 
I don't know of any political group that's trying to get us off the air, but I do happen to know about a religious group. And so persecution of the Word of God began in organized religion here. And this man now is physically being persecuted. And I read on here. It came to pass on the morrow that Pasha brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasha, but Magor Mesabib. And that's quite a name, by the way. But it means terror on every side. It meant terror for Pasha. It meant terror for everyone connected with him. Verse 4, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll make thee a terror to thyself, to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. This is now the prophecy that this man Jeremiah will emphasize again and again, and that is that the southern kingdom is now going into captivity. Nothing can stop that. Even if Moses was there, our Samuel was there, God says it wouldn't help. Not now. They've gone too far. And this king that's on the throne, those that had been ahead of him, revealed it, by the way. Now, we'd want to drop down here. I'm going to have to hit high points from here on in Jeremiah. Verse 9, and probably I should give a little background of this. Jeremiah has been ignored, and he's been rejected. But up to this point, he hadn't been persecuted physically. And now he is. And because of all of this, and after all, the message is breaking his own heart. He decides that he's going to turn in his resignation. And your heart can't help but go out to this man. He's not indifferent to what is happening. He feels this a great deal, and it's sapping his strength. And I think he's frankly on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Now, notice what he says. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Now, what he says is simply this. He says, the message is breaking my heart, and all that it's earned for me is the persecution of the religious rulers and the rejection by the people, and therefore I'm resigning. But he says, when I attempted to resign, the Word of God was in his bones like a fire. And he said, I had to speak out. I couldn't forbear. And that, my friend, is another one of the marks and should be the mark of a man that's giving out the Word of God today. How do you really feel about it? Is this a job that you have? Or is this something really your heart's in it? You want to give out the Word of God. You love the Word of God. And you'd feel pretty bad if you didn't have the privilege of giving it out. And until you feel like that, I'm not sure that you ought to be uh, attempting to give out the Word of God. It ought to mean something to you. Now, you can see the conflict that's going on in the heart of this man. Now, he indulges in something that was apparently an Old Testament custom, or it became an Old Testament habit on the part of some of God's men here. Do you notice what he attempts to do? Well, he does something that Jonah did, and something that Job did, and something that Elijah did. It's singing an old song that won't do you a bit of good. It's the blues. It's known as the religious blues. Why was I born? <laughs> and there are a lot of folk that will sing that song. Listen to him, verse 14. "'Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bare me be blessed.'" Oh, boy, does he hate himself, and he wish he hadn't been born. "'Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man-child is born unto thee,' making him very glad. And then, verse 18, 
Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my day should be consumed with shame. And it's the old story. Why was I born? Elijah crawled up under juniper tree, said, let me die. <laughs> and we find that Job wanted to die. Curse the day he was born. And old Jonah, he got pretty downhearted, too, about everything. And he also wanted to die. Well, to wish that you'd not been born, that's about as foolish as anything you can wish, friends, because you're already born, and there's nothing you can do about that. And then you can sing the blues that you want to die, and you never die by wishing it. Nobody's never died by that method. He's way down, is he not? This is Jeremiah. You feel like putting your arm around him now, don't you, and patting him on the back and encouraging him. But I tell you, this man wants to give out the Word of God. Now in chapter 21, we come to the reign of Zedekiah. This is the last king, and this is right before the captivity. And you'll not have any harsher message than is given here in this message that takes in chapter 21 and 22. Now will you listen? The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent unto him Pasha the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah the son of Maaseiah the priest, saying, Inquire, I pray thee, of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon maketh war against us. Now, it's interesting that when Zedekiah got in real trouble, who did he go to? He went to the man that he knew was giving the word of God. He passed by Pasher and his crowd. He didn't go to organize religion. It's interesting that I find a great many people today have belonged to a liberal church, but they listen to a Bible broadcast. And they, for some strange reason, feel like that they can reconcile that. My friend, when you're in trouble, nothing's going to satisfy you but the Word of God. Now he comes to Jeremiah, but he doesn't get any comfort from Jeremiah at all. He says that Nebuchadnezzar is coming down, and he's going to take this city unless there's a turning to God. And he lays it on the line. Listen to him in verse 8 now of chapter 21. And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And that's exactly what God says today about his salvation and his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, I gave my son to die for you, and he died to pay the penalty of your sins. He rose that you might have righteousness, and if you're saved, you must be in him, and you get in him by the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you trust him as your Savior. And when you do, you become a child of God, and this is my way, and you can take it or leave it. God says, I set before you life and death. And that's the way God's put it. And God does it with tears in his eyes, too. But my friend, that's the way he's laid it down before us today. And he laid it down before this king here. Now, this man Zedekiah, the last of the kings, he doesn't follow through. He's a weakling to begin with. And he's the worst one. And so there's no turning to God actually at all. And he had followed Jeconiah. You see, there had been Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and then there had been Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim. My, there are a lot of them. Then Zedekiah. Now, Zedekiah was on the throne, and he could look back and say, well, look, God didn't let Nebuchadnezzar destroy this city when Jehoiachin was on the throne, and he was about as bad as I was, why should it happen now? Now, friends, the harshest message given in the Word of God he gave here in this 22nd chapter, the judgment against the father of Jehoiachin, the judgment against Jehoiakim. He was an evil ruler also, but during his reign, there was prosperity, and men were getting rich, and the poor were being ground underfoot. That was the picture that you have. And the very interesting thing is that God has a great deal 
to say in his word about the poor. The very fact that the word of God pays so much attention to that. You can't ignore it, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, will you notice verse 13? This begins God's message concerning Jehoiakim. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. That is, getting rich by a wrong method. And his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. You see, underpaid. And while the rich man's getting richer, the poor man is getting poorer. That saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shalt thou reign, because thou closeth thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink, and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. Now he's referring back to Josiah, the good king. Now listen to what he says about him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. Now, that's chapter 22, and I read from verse 13 down through verse 17. And I could read on, but I'm going to break off the reading at that particular juncture because here you find God's judgment that's pronounced upon them Two things were happening. The rich were getting rich by wrong methods, and the poor were getting poorer. And the average man actually was suffering in that day, while a few were getting rich. Now, God has a great deal to say about this. This man, Jeremiah, he calls attention to it here that rich men were heaping up wealth by others' labors, and they were treading down the poor. And in their pride and in their arrogance, they built themselves palaces and lived as though God had forgotten their iniquitous means of the acquisition of wealth. And may I say to you that the Word of God has a great deal to say about it. He said in the New Testament, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. There are two things that God condemns the rich for, the way they get money and the way that they spend money, the way they use it. And may I say this very candidly, that Everything is slanted for the rich man. I find out that I'm paying more taxes than some men that are worth a million dollars. Well, you'd think I was a millionaire. And I've discovered that the tax laws are geared to protect the rich, and the politicians gear everything in favor of the rich, those that give to political campaigns. That's about all they do give to. They never give to the Lord's work. They never give anything to get the Word of God out. God notices that. God recognizes that. The way they make it, they make it at the expense of the poor, and they spend it on themselves, building palaces to live in. Now, I want to say this very candidly, and I know that I step on some toes. And somebody is going to say, well, McGee, it's quite obvious. You're sure not trying to get the support of the rich people for your program. Well, I'm giving you what Jeremiah gave. He never got the support of the rich either. And I'll have to take it on the chin. But very frankly, it's sinful for any man to live in a mansion while there's so many poor people today that are in poverty. No Christian ought to do that. Now, if you've got that kind of money, why aren't you spending it to help some of the poor? 
And there are a lot of poor Christians. Now, I know that they go to the ghetto or they appeal to certain races, but there are a lot of God's children today are poor folk, and they're not being helped. I know they're not being helped, and irrespective of color, there are a lot of poor people that are Christians, that God's children, and the rich Christian is passing them by while they're building mansions to live in. Houses that cost a million dollars. And I'm not sure that Christian organizations ought to have plush and luxurious accommodations. I want to be very frank today that until we deal with this, and religion caters to the rich. I meet many preachers that like to tell me, well, I have so-and-so, you know, he's a millionaire. He's a member of my church. Well, I'd like to know what he's doing to get the Word of God out. I played golf with a man they told me was worth $20 million. They wanted me to play with him. He says, you know, he's interested in your program. He listens to it, you know. And we rode along, and I must confess, I told a man all about the program, not until he asked. And when he asked, I could give him an enthusiastic sales talk about the Through the Bible program, what it's doing today. And he, oh, he was interested, said he listened to the program. You know how much he's given to the program? Not one dime. You say, well, McGee, you're crying. (laughs) And you're using yourself as an illustration again. Maybe so, but I'm telling you what I know. And this is something I know today. And this is the thing that the Word of God condemns, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Read the epistle of James. He has a whole chapter devoted to the rich and the way that they get their money, and the way that they spend their money today. I'd hate to be a man, a Christian, that leaves a million dollars when I die. I think, my friend, you're going to be in trouble when you come in the presence of the Lord. He'll want to know, and I don't think he'd object to your comforts. I think he wants you to be. He wouldn't have given you all of that. But he also is going to hold you responsible for using it in a way for the glory of God. Now, I'm in trouble. I recognize that. But somebody needs to speak out on this because there's too much of this in the Word of God. And God makes it very clear here. In verse 16, He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? God says, Josiah knew me. And he knew that he couldn't be my follower and not have a concern for the poor and needy because God says, I have a concern for them. The two groups of people that the hardest people to reach with the gospel, you know who they are? The filthy rich and the dirty poor. The one that are very poor and the one that are very rich. Now, God says, I'd like to equalize that because I want them to hear the gospel and be saved. I want the rich way up at the top to help those way down at the bottom. That's exactly what God is saying. And then those two groups can be reached with the Word of God. And that, may I say, I think is fundamentally the problem in America today. I do not think it's racial. I do not think it's a class struggle. I think it's a question today of rich and poor, my friend. That is the struggle that's in the world today. And communism never would have risen in the world if it had not been for the filthy rich and for the dirty poor. Those two. And it's the thing that God says he judges. My, it's difficult to let this alone. Now, here is the harshest judgment that's pronounced in the Word of God. Here in this 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 24 through 30. And Jeremiah has called upon Zedekiah to turn back to God in obedience. And he warns that failure to do so is going to bring immediate judgment. And now we come here. This is a harsher judgment than God pronounced upon Cain or the Lord Jesus pronounced upon Judas. This is I say frightful, and it's one of the most remarkable prophecies in the Word of God. Listen to him. As I live, saith the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, 
Now, Coniah is Jehoiachin, and he's called Jeconiah also. Why isn't that J-E put on here? God took his name, which would be Jehovah, away from him. God says, you don't identify me as that man. And he says here, as I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet I'd pluck thee things. Why, God says, if he was a ring on my finger, I'd throw him away, and I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And now we read verse 28. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken vessel? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed and are cast into a land which they know not. And then he cries to the earth to witness. And here's something the earth ought to hear today. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And my friend, this is the reason that Joseph could not be the father of Jesus, one of the reasons at least, because he's in this line and God says there's not going to be anyone in this line to sit on the throne at all. And he makes that, I think, very clear. Over in Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, verse 17, he says, "...for thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Jacob." Well, then... Kaniah can't be in the line, you see. And yet there is going to be one in the line. And in 36.30 here of Jeremiah, God says, Therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, He shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day and the heat and in the night to the frost. I tell you, God cut off that line. And the remarkable thing is, the reason we have two genealogies of Jesus, the one in Matthew leads to Joseph. Joseph gave him the legal title to the throne, but no one can come from that line. So you have Mary's genealogy in Luke, and that comes through Nathan. There's no curse on that line or judgment at all. And the Lord Jesus came through that line, and he got the blood title to the throne of David. My friend, that's one of the most remarkable things in the world, I think, today. And God calls to the earth, listen to me, he says. This is the way that I worked it out. And don't think that I can't bring judgment, even when it looks otherwise. This is remarkable, friends. Now, in chapter 23, we do have a ray of hope. What is the popular song, Every Cloud Has a Silver Lining? Well, this cloud, dark cloud, has a silver lining because it never got so dark but what the prophet didn't see down into the future. Now, in chapter 23, after this harshest judgment that's in the Bible against Coniah, then the sun breaks through. Now, he opens chapter 23, though, with this, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. And the pastors here are not preachers. He'll speak about the religious rulers later on. But here, the pastors are the kings, the politicians, the people that are ruling, the ones that are making the laws, those that are at the top. And God says, Woe to them. Now, he says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock. You've driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And God says he's going to judge them. And he did in that day. Now the sun breaks through. It never got so dark, but what the prophet didn't look down to the end of the tunnel. And he saw the light. Verse 3 of chapter 23 of Jeremiah. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I've driven them. And I will bring them again to their folds. 
and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. God says, the day is coming that I intend to take over. And when I do, then you'll see the poor taken care of. And you're going to see an altogether different type of government than we have in the world today. Verse 5, Now behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, there's a king coming in David's line. But this king, Jeconiah, and all of this line, although they be in David's line, they are rejected and cut off. But you can't destroy God's purpose. You may think you can. But God will bring through another line, the line of Nathan, another son of David. And through that line there will come a peasant by the name of Mary, a peasant girl up in Nazareth, and she's going to bear the Messiah. She's going to bear the king, if you please. And when he presented himself to the world, he says, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you can't have a kingdom without the king. What he said, the king is here. And they rejected the king. But my friend, he has the last word. He rejected them, and he said, The king's coming back someday. And he's going to set up that kingdom. Verse 6, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. May I say to you, have you ever heard of that being a plank in some political campaign that the man's righteous and he's going to act righteous? I haven't found that yet. They make every other claim except they're going to be righteous and they're going to follow God's plan and God's program for a government. They don't dare say that today. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. They shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up, which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries, whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Now, this is one of the most remarkable prophecies in the Word of God. The oldest religious holiday that there is today is Passover, a Jewish Passover. And regardless of what type of uh, Israelite the man might be, could be Reformed or Orthodox, wouldn't make any difference. They remember the Passover, the deliverance out of Egypt that goes back. God says the day is coming when I bring them back into that land which I shall do that they'll forget the deliverance out of Egypt and they will remember this new thing that I intend to do. It'll so far surpass the deliverance out of the land of Egypt. This is tremendous, my friend. And you either believe this or you don't believe it. God's not through with the nation Israel. Now, verse 17, "...they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say, every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you." And these dreamers today are talking about they're going to bring in world peace. And all of them are talking along that line God says you won't do it. You can't do it. God says, as we saw in Isaiah, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Our problem is not the fact that you can't make peace and that people don't want peace. The trouble is that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't know how bad we really are. And wicked men in power today cannot bring peace on this earth. And if they can... They'll contradict God's Word. Verse 21, he turns now to the religious rulers. He said, you can't trust today the political rulers. They can't bring in this peace. They ignore the poor. 
And in verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. And God says, now this bunch of prophets, and the land was filled with them in that day. God says, I didn't send them. They're not giving my message at all. God rejected both the political rulers and the religious rulers. And I think that he'd do the same thing today in this world, all over the world. Because who's seeking for God today, even among the religious rulers of the world? They're out for religion. Oh, they're religion up to their eyebrows. And as pious as a poison puppy. But they just don't happen be seeking after the living and true God. Now, God says here in verse 30, "...therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor." And today, the liberal is casting reflection on the Word of God, says it's not the Word of God, stealing out of the hearts of people. I'd hate to be a godless college professor or a godless preacher today, who is wrecking the faith of believers. God says, here, I'm going to do something about it someday. And God's in no hurry. Don't let that deceive you, because judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily. It's in the heart of the sons of man to do evil. They think they're getting by with it. God says, i got eternity ahead of me, and I happen to be running the show anyway, and the time will come when I'll handle it. Now, we have here... In chapter 24, the sign of the figs here. Good figs, bad figs. God makes the distinction between good and evil, and he does it here. And he says that it just happens to be, I intend to send these people into captivity because these are bad figs. That is God's judgment and his estimation. Now you come in chapter 25 to a remarkable chapter because now Jeremiah, he spells out the captivity and even gives the length of time that they'll go into captivity. In chapter 25, verse 9, "...behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant." Remember now, Daniel had led this man into a saving knowledge of God and will bring him against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Now, a great many people wonder why the land of Israel is not the land flowing with milk and honey today. A great water shortage is over there today. They desperately need water. Now, why is that true? God says, I intend to make it a perpetual desolation. I intend to let the world know I've judged not only a people, but a land. And the judgment of God is upon that land specifically, as the curse of sin is in the entire earth. This earth is not producing near what it's capable of producing, because the curse of sin is upon it. Now, God says, moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. God is taking away from them, he says, all the fun they've been having. And no more marrying and giving in marriage. The sound of the millstone, business, commerce was going to end. And the light of the candle, that's at home in the evening. There'll be no more of that. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. When God's dealing with the nation Israel, he deals with a calendar. He'll spell out the time. When he's dealing with the church, there's no time given. And you and I have no right today to say that even the Lord Jesus is coming soon. How do you know that? You don't know it. We have not been given a cow. Now, somebody says, but McGee, you say you believe he's coming soon. That's right. And I say it right now. I believe he's coming soon. You want to know something? I don't know. We just don't know. And we have no right to say he's coming soon. We can just say we believe it. That's as far as we can go. 
Verse 12, "...it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And in that nation saith the Lord for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations." Now, God has done that. There's no argument here. If you want to argue this, you're arguing semantics, and you're not arguing prophecy. God has accomplished this. Now, at this time, Nebuchadnezzar had already taken away a delegation, and those that remained under Zedekiah, they were paying tribute. In fact, under Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And these kings actually were all alike. After Josiah, beginning with Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, they are as much alike as peas in a pod. They were all evil after Josiah. And now he has pronounced that Nebuchadnezzar will come and finally destroy Jerusalem and take the people into captivity. In fact, all of them into captivity. And the 70 years has now been given definitely by Jeremiah. Now, that does not conclude it. Beginning at verse 15, he says, "...for thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury in my hand, and I will cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. Now, beginning here at verse 18, he lists these nations. The first, of course, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, the kings and the princes. And then Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is picked out. Then the kings of Uz, the Philistines, Ashkelon, Azar, and Ekron, and Ashdod, and Edom, and Moab, and Ammon, and the kings of Tyre and Sidon, and the islands which are beyond the sea. In other words... This is the thing that he's saying to them, that they are to take the wine cup of the wrath of God. Now, this is a figure of speech that several of the prophets used, and they spoke of the sin of man as he continues in rebellion against God, especially as it relates not only to his own people but the nations of the world, that it's like a wine cup that's filling up with wrath. And when it gets full, then the judgment of God breaks upon the earth. And then he makes them drink that wine cup, which, of course, is the judgment of God. Now, all of the nations in that particular area, and even beyond it, were to be judged of God because of the fact they were so far from God. And it reveals that God does overrule in the nations of the world. Now, we find, beginning down here, verse 30 of this chapter, he says, "...therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation." He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, this is to be a judgment not confined to Israel. In other words, Babylon is to become the first great world power that will dominate all the nations of the then civilized world. And then he pronounces, of course, especially upon the nation Israel, But it reaches beyond that in verse 32. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Now, it was this tremendous movement of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, as he moved out over the then civilized world and even brought Egypt and brought Tyre and Sidon, these great powers 
including Judah, under his sovereignty. Now, he had already moved down, and some of the people had been taken, and Zedekiah was paying tribute. But now these nations want to come together, and they want to oppose the king of Babylon, and they believe that that's the way that it shall be done, that if they can do that, why, everything's going to work out all right. And we find that Jeremiah, for his people now, having given this message, and it was rejected, and judgment came just as God said it would. In chapter 26, we have here this that we had had before. If you'll recall, I think it was way back in the seventh chapter where he was told there to stand in the gate. Now, here, there's been a change in chapter 26. In verse 2 of chapter 26, he says, "...stand in the court of the Lord's house." And this is a message that he'd already given in the time of Jehoiakim. It's repeated now at the time of Zedekiah. And these messages here all relate to the reign of Zedekiah. In fact, through the 30th chapter, actually, this is one message. It's the final word of God to these people before the captivity. Now, he's to stand there as these people see they're coming to the temple. I'm of the opinion that many of us that had been there and had seen this outward show of worship and the prosperity that was in the land at this time, nobody seemed to be complaining that it looked as if God was rather petulant and being petty with the people. But they were far from God, and there was awful sin in the land. And now he is to cry out against this. And he says to the people, verse 3 of chapter 26, "...if so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil." And when God repents, it doesn't mean he's changed his mind. He means the people have changed, and then God won't judge, but he'll bless. And it looks as if God had changed his mind. But God will always punish sin. He always will pardon the sinner that will come to him. That never changes. But when a sinner who's under the judgment of God turns to God and is blessed and saved, then it looks as if God changed his mind. But actually, the sinner had done that. God says, if you will, then God says, I wouldn't destroy you. I wouldn't judge you. Then verse 4 here, Thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken unto me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then I will make this house like Shiloh, and which means it was destroyed. And I'll make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. And Jerusalem has been a burden in this world. It is right now, by the way. It's a pawn today. You talk about Israel has Jerusalem. May I say to you that America and Russia today, back and forth, it's like a pawn on the chessboard. God says, I'll make it a burden to all nations. And he certainly has done that. And Jerusalem should have been a blessing to the world, but it would become the opposite. Now, when he gave this prophecy, verse 8, Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Now things are getting bad, you see. And they have not only resisted the message of God through Jeremiah, they're now going to kill Jeremiah off. They want to get rid of him. And you see something that is taking place here. There are three groups, and I'm not going to read all of this, through this section here, because it's not only a little technical, but it's a little tiring back and forth. But you have the princes and the priests and the people. Now, they all resist Jeremiah at the first. But finally, the princes decide they ought to hear him. And Jeremiah had a message for them. 
Well, let me read verse 11. Here now, chapter 26. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Now, the priests and the prophets were of one mind that Jeremiah must die. They never changed their mind at all. They had determined his death. They never changed. Now, the princes were with him at first, but the princes decided we better hear Jeremiah. Then the people who had been with the priests came over with the princes. That's a little complicated, as you can see. Then, will you notice verse 12, "...then spoke Jeremiah unto all the princes, to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he has pronounced against you." Now, he spells it out, what they've done, verse 15, "...but know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves, upon this city, upon the inhabitants of a truth." Now, verse 16, "...then said the princess and all the people under the priests and the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he hath spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God." So you see now that the princes, the rulers... And there's something here that I think that we need to note. At this particular time, when this man Jeremiah made the statement that that temple was to be destroyed, he committed a blasphemy. In fact, of the matter is, he's guilty of heresy. He's a heretic when he said that. The false prophets were saying, God won't let this temple fall. It's his temple. And God won't let Jerusalem fall. It's his city. God won't let it happen. Jeremiah says, you're entirely wrong. You are disassociating religion from morality. And that's what a great many of us fundamentalists do today. We think because we're fundamental, we believe the Word of God. And actually, we make the Word of God almost a fetish today. My friend, may I say this to you? You may be fundamental to the core. And I don't yield to any man to being any more fundamental. In fact, one of the evangelicals in this area, he says that McGee leans backward. He's so fundamental. I don't mind that. I think that's true. But I do want to say this, that when you begin to divorce morality from your religion, from your fundamentalism, my friend... May I say to you, you're entirely wrong, and you have made your religion and the Word of God a fetish, sort of a good luck charm to carry around with you, and you think that that's all you need to do. A great many people, and I heard during World War II, you remember they gave out a New Testament to a soldier boy, and he put it up in his shirt pocket, went into battle, and a bullet hit it, and it saved his life, and... Oh, my, isn't it wonderful? He had a New Testament. Well, why didn't somebody give him a Sears and Roebuck catalog? And then he could have stopped maybe a bigger bullet than that. May I say, how foolish can you be today, friends, relative to these matters? The Word of God is no fetish, and you can't divorce your life from it. And that's what the false prophet said, God won't let it happen. And there are a great many people saying, because I'm fundamental and I believe the Bible... These things can't happen to me. They can happen to you, my friend. When you and I get away from God, God's going to judge us. And we'll do well to believe his word, by the way. How important they are. And the interesting thing, these prophets did not change their mind, these false prophets. And the priests did not change their mind, but the princess did. And that's the thing that saved the life of this man. Now, again, let me make this statement here. There are people today that say, well, I live a consistent Christian life. I believe the Bible and I rest upon it. Well, fine. That's good. I want to stand with you on that. I try to do that. May I say to you that you must remember that it was these priests who wanted to put 
this man Jeremiah to death, the princes were willing to hear them. And it's been my experience that when a spiritual authority becomes corrupt and debased, it's far more evil than when politics become corrupt and debased. When the civil authority is corrupt, that's bad. When the religious authority becomes corrupt, that's lots worse. And sometimes our consistency may be just another word for our bigotry, my friend. And that'll mean our judgment. We need to recognize that. And the very interesting thing is, who was it put Jesus to death on the cross? Actually, it was not the people that did it. It was the priests that did it. It was the religious rulers of that day that did it. And it was true in Jeremiah's day. And by the way, this reveals something else about the people here, that it's a fallacy, this idea today that vox populi, vox dei, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. And a lot of people believe that today in this country. My friend, you mean that the moving mob, the fickle crowd today that will go after one TV personality, if a man has got a personality, he can be elected to any office, and he may be the biggest fool there is in the world and corrupt in his life. That is the worst thing in the world. And I thank God that he's not going to let the world vote Jesus in. If he did, he'd never get in. He's going to send him to this earth someday to put down rebellion. And here he says to his people, amend your ways and your doings. The people are wrong, and the princes are wrong, and the priests are wrong, and the prophets are wrong. And this man Jeremiah, and I do want to say this for him here, all he is sure of, is that he's giving the Word of God. He's not sure of himself at all. And my feeling is that having turned from the Word of God, there are several things happening today. Have you noticed how popular the zodiac has become to some people today in the horoscope? They are more concerned about what it says than what the Word of God says. And then there are great many, and this is the thing really disturbs me, And I move, of course, in a certain circle of ministers and leaders today. And they all seem to think they are the final authority, and they know. And I appreciate the book of Jeremiah. It helps me, because I can make a confession to you right now, and I hope you won't let it get out, but I have to say it. The more I study the Word of God, the more I am impressed by my ignorance of the Word of God. Why, I want to say to you that I've come to the conclusion that I know very little, and I'm sure many of you had already come to that conclusion. Some of the letters I get indicate that. May I say to you, I'm impressed by the fact of my ignorance of the Word of God. Now, the thing that disturbs me, I meet so many people that think they know it. They think they're the final authority. You know, it was said of Socrates... He made this statement. He said, I'm the wisest man in Athens. And they said, why in the world you say you're the wisest man in Athens? Well, he says, I know that I do not know anything. The rest of the people, they don't know they don't know anything. They think they know something. May I say to you, the only claim I could make today is that I know now I'm ignorant of the Word of God. And I do wish that some of these folk, they give me an inferiority complex. I wish they'd find out that they are ignorant of the Word of God. Someone has put it like this. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is almost teach him. He who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep. Wake him. He who knows and knows what he knows, is wise, follow him. I will accept the first three stanzas there. I wouldn't accept the last one at all, because I don't think we know. And that is the position now of Jeremiah, that all he knows is the Word of God. These people, the false prophets are saying, 
that nothing's going to happen, and he says something is going to happen. Now, when you come to chapter 27 here, and it's all in this same period. It's in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. And it's agreed by scholars that this actually came not only then, but came with great force to this man, Zedekiah, the worst of the kings, but they're all in the same boat, by the way. Now, the message is to go out again to all the nations that they are to yield to the king of Babylon. And this man, Jeremiah, he illustrated it. He put a wooden yoke around his neck, and he sent yokes to all of these others. You are to bow to the king of Babylon. Verse 8, It shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom, which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. And they now are to yield. This is the one clear voice, and this voice is a clear-cut voice, that they are all to yield to the king of Babylon. And had they done that, which they didn't do, they would have saved human life, literally by the thousands. Now, in chapter 28, this prophecy of the yokes continues. And in this, this man Hananiah, the prophet, his prophecy was this, verse 2, chapter 28. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them away. And he'd bring back even Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim. Well, the fact of the matter is that Jeremiah made it clear that Hananiah was not a prophet of God. And he told him that he was a liar. That's a nice way of treating a false prophet. But that's what he said to him, that he was a liar and that he would die inside of a year. And you know what happened? Verse 15 now, chapter 20. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I'll cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. He died, just as Jeremiah said. Now you would think that this would alert the people and say, Well, look, Jeremiah is the one who's calling the shots. Jeremiah is the one that has the understanding. I believe that we had the greatest opportunity any nation ever had after World War II, and we muffed it. And the reason is this, and I'm not discussing parties now, but we have never had a leader in this country from World War II on, and it's caused this nation to miss the greatest opportunity. We have been listening to the wrong voices, and there should be that voice that comes down through the centuries that speaks with authority. And we've never had anyone like that. And as a result, actually, the great middle class of our nation, as well as other nations, has been corrupted. Now, friends, in this message that we have been looking at that actually concludes the first major section of Jeremiah, why this last chapter, chapter 29, has a little glimmer of light. There's been a great deal of judgment, and there's judgment yet to come that will be mentioned. But here we have a little glimmer of light, and you'll recall that there was that strange thing that Jeremiah enacted out. He took yokes of wood. He put one on himself, and he sent one to each of the kings that were in that surrounding area and told them to bow to Nebuchadnezzar that was coming. Well, of course, the false prophets in Israel said, no, don't agree with Jeremiah, because God will never deliver this city into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. 
and he'll not deliver the temple. Well, already these people here at the time of Zedekiah were paying tribute to the king of Babylon, and already one delegation had been taken captive. But the city had not been destroyed, nor the temple. And the people believed it was inviolate, that it was impossible for God to permit that temple to be destroyed. To them, it was a fetish. It was just a good luck charm. And it was that sort of a thing. A great many people carry a Bible just like that today. A great many people think because they're members of a certain church that that is the important thing, that that'll be the thing the Lord will talk to them about someday. Well, then Jeremiah made it clear not only would these yokes of wood be removed, and they were temporarily, that is, Nebuchadnezzar let up in a very fine way here, and he apparently wanted to let the people return, and he would have returned the vessels of the temple and let the people continue. But they went on in their rebellion against God. In fact, Zedekiah at that very moment was plotting to rebel, and he was trying to get the nations to join with him. And they had a mind to join with him in order that they might rebel. Now Jeremiah tells them that the yokes of wood will be broken, but they're being broken in order that yokes of iron might be put on them. And that when Nebuchadnezzar came this next time, it wouldn't be so easy that he would destroy their cities and take them in captivity. Now he has a word in chapter 29 of those that went into captivity under Jehoiachin. And this is the word for them. He tells them to go willingly, not to rebel, that the judgment of God has come, that no way of deterring it. And now he says here in verse 10, this encouraging word, "...for thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place." In other words, he predicts now the return back to that land that go into captivity for seventy years. Now, he makes it very clear why they're going into captivity. In verse 23, he says, "...because they have committed villainy in Israel, and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them, even I know and am a witness, saith the Lord." Now, this is a very, I think, a very remarkable verse. The thing that had happened was that the great middle class in Israel, in Judah, had become corrupt. And they had become corrupt because of the fact that there were a corrupt priesthood and the prophets were false prophets. I would say today that liberalism is absolutely wrecking the church today. It has already done almost a complete job of wrecking the church. church has no influence today whatsoever. And certainly it's away from its main mission of getting out the Word of God. And there went into captivity in that day this great heart section of the nation Israel. And that means the better class of people, to tell the truth. I've emphasized this before, that filthy rich at the top and the dirty poor at the bottom. That group, extreme groups, are the hardest people to reach with the Word of God. And neither group are the backbone of any nation. They are always a destructive force in any nation. And the middle class are the ones. I'd like to give you a line that comes from an Englishman, and it goes back, I think, to World War I, because that's when England, of course, went down. And listen to this word. Princes and lords may flourish or may fade. A breath can make them as a breath has made. But a bold peasantry, their country's pride, 
when once destroyed, can never be supplied. A time there was ere England's griefs began, when every rood of ground maintained its man. For him light labor spread her wholesome store, just gave what life required, but gave no more. And that's just a little excerpt from that poem. Well, that was the bedrock of England. And that bedrock has apparently been corrupted. And I would say that the Beatles not only did a worldwide job, they did a thorough job to their own nation. And England has gone down, as this country must inevitably come down, because when the middle class becomes corrupt, And that is the thing now that this man Jeremiah is saying to them, the reason that you're going into captivity is because of the sins of the middle class here, the class that were the backbone of the nation. And this is the thing that has happened to them. So that now we see them go into captivity. And that is the thing here that is before us. Now, there is something else we see that has taken place at this time, and that is just simply this, this tremendous verse. The first part has to do the reason of why they went into captivity. And now God makes a strange statement. He says, "...even I know and am a witness, saith the Lord." Now, I mentioned last time that the day we were going to mention the fact that this nation has never had an outstanding leader in World War II or today. That has been the thing that's almost characterized this century that we're in. A leader that sees down and has a knowledge of the future. Someone asked Gladstone, the great English jurist, years ago, What was the mark of a great statesman? And he gave this answer. He said, A great statesman is a man that knows the direction that God is going for the next 50 years. Now, that has been the thing that has been lacking in our country today because of the fact that the only one that actually knows today is God. He has all the knowledge. We don't have the knowledge. Now, I'll be very frank with you, and I made this confession last time. I don't mind making it again. I don't want to weary you with it. But the fact today is, and the thing that overwhelms me, and it's really a little discouraging. I've been studying the Word of God for many years. But I'm just now getting to the place where I see my ignorance of the Bible. Now, the thing that I think I need, I feel Jeremiah had that problem. Jeremiah, when he stood up, he told what he knew, which was the Word of God. And I try to confine myself to that, but there are certain great principles that are laid down here, and I disagree with Edersheim. He says history never repeats itself. Well, I think it does repeat itself. At least certain great principles are put down. And God speaks to nations and to individuals in history as well as his word. I believe that history should bear a message to this country. And the reason we do not have leadership today is because men are totally ignorant of God that are in politics today. The woeful ignorance today of the word of God in this nation is appalling. I read an article by a certain man that I gave you part of it the other day. He called the Bible filled with error and all that sort of thing. What gave him the authority to make a statement like that? Where did he arrive at such an exalted plane that he can sit in judgment on the Word of God? The very fact that a man will move to that position today is to me a revelation of woeful ignorance and a presumption and pride that's beyond description. And the same thing if you go in the scientific world. 
the scientist today who knows is generally an humble man. These folk that speak today, these science teachers in our junior colleges and colleges who know actually very little science to tell the truth, they speak with such great authority about the evolution of man. Well, what really do you know, you see? Well, I want to come back to this. All I know is what the Word of God says. And God says, I know. And I'm a witness, saith the Lord. Now, God has worked out certain things in history that are quite impressive here. And God speaks to men in history. That's what he's trying to tell these people here. This is the thing that's happening to you because of your sin. Because I always judge it. Now, God has not changed. A lot of people would like to think that the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. He's the same person, by the way. Hasn't changed a bit. He hasn't even grown old. <laughs> he hasn't even learned anything. He's the same God you have in the Old Testament. Now, not only has God spoken in history, but God, of course, has spoken in His Word. And that's rather impressive. The thing that, you remember Peter says over in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 20, Knowing this first. Now, here's something that this is primary stuff. This is what you get in the first grade. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, there are two ways that's been taken that are wrong. One way is that the way that you study prophecy, you put it all together. No prophecy, you to take it by itself and study it to the exclusion of others. Well, I think that's a true statement, but that's not what this passage says. Then there are those that say that you have no right to interpret prophecy on your own, that you have no right. Well, that takes away from me not only the First Amendment, but it takes away from me the free will that God gave me. And therefore, I say that that's not what it means. Now, it hasn't anything in the world to do what God is saying here with the end result of his revelation. It has everything to do with the origin of it. And what he's saying here, that no writing was a private interpretation as to its origin. That is, these prophets who wrote and spoke in olden time didn't give you the result of their observations they were speaking what God told them to speak. And my friend, that's very important to see in this particular passage that we have here. And when you and I can come to the place where actually we are going to lay in the dust, oh, not just the fact that we are a nobody and that we are sinners and all that sort of thing, but we're willing to lay into the dust our opinions, our self-will, our own viewpoint of things, and put it all down and listen to what God has to say. That was the problem with the priests and the prophets in that day. That was the problem with the princess in that day. That was the problem with the people in that day. And I'm not sure, but what that may be the problem in our country today. Every man's got his own little viewpoint doing his own little thing, carrying his own little placard, protesting his own little thing, and he's doing it out of a limited knowledge. man asked me the other day about a decision that the President of the United States made. Want to know what I thought? Well, I want to say this. So what difference does it make what I think? I don't have all the facts that he has. I don't have the background. And today, to sit in judgment on God, as some people are doing today, why, it's almost unbelievable that little man stands up and going to say, Now, Lord, if you're up there, and I'm not sure you are, I'm pretty hard to convince down here. You see, I have quite a giant intellect, and my intellect says you may not even be up there. But if you are up there, I just want to say to you, I think you're wrong. May I say to you... <laughs> That's very small potatoes. I can imagine a little old ant that would crawl into my house and crawl upon my chair and look up at me and say, Look, 
I don't like the way you built this house. I don't like the way you plant things around here. I don't like what you eat. You know what I would say to that little ant? I would step on him. That'd be the end of that little ant. But God is so gracious, the man, he doesn't step on him. He's going to give him another chance, if you please.